So, let us uh, what we have done is we have just formulated the integral equation, we have not yet come upon how do we actually solve it. Um, so, now we will look at how to solve it and we will see that solving this is actually not that difficult at least in this case. So, let us see what ok. So, let us let us draw this once again. So, this was my z x y. Okay. As with any system of equa any equation that you see the first strategy to solve it is to discretize it. So, we will follow the same thing over here. My variable is rho of y. So, I should discretize along the y axis right. So, what I will do is I will discretize it like this. Okay, into little little segments and let each segment have um, some width. Let us keep it simple constant width capital delta ok, that is how I have uh, discretized it ok. Now, uh, this uh, charge that I had over here, the charge is sitting over here on the surface as I said as a one, dimen one dimensional line charge that is the unknown. So, what I do now is this is the um, a little bit of a trick this unknown function over here I write it as the sum of n functions each one with a coefficient a n and the function g n ok. So, what is this g n over here I have written it over here it is what is called a pulse function. So, what is uh, what is this uh, pulse look like? So, first of all there are capital N pulses that I have used. The definition of this pulse is that it is 1 inside the nth segment and 0 everywhere else right. So, if I were to plot this, so this is n minus 1 delta and this is n delta right. So, this function is 1 over here and 0 elsewhere. Okay, and 0. So, so for example, we can call this, this is your g n. Okay. Now, if I want to show you g n plus 1, what will it look like? g n plus 1, this pulse would be to the, will it overlap with the previous function? No, right, it will be to the right, right. So, if I if I draw this over here, let me just sorry. Right, so this is going to be G N plus one. Right. So the idea is clear what we are trying to do? We are trying to approximate this function in terms of pulses. So, it is you know if I had a function like this, if this is the actual function, I am trying to make a piecewise constant approximation of this function right. I am going to say this is how I am going to approximate my function ok. It is crude, but what it does is it makes our math easy ok and later we will see how to get a little bit more uh, sophisticated about uh, these things. So, these are the, the the correct terminology for them are these are called basis functions ok. So, we have chosen a basis function which are the simplest basis functions pulse basis functions ok. So, we will call these as basis functions for for what for rho. Now, having done this remember our unknown was this rho which was a function. Now, I say that solving for a function is a difficult thing, let me make my life a little simpler, let me now solve for something else. So, when I converted from rho to this guy over here, what became my unknown? The a's right, so these now are my unknowns, so unknown and are they functions or just scalars, scalars right. So, which looks easier to you solving for rho or solving for a? A right, I am just have to I just have to solve for a bunch of numbers which is much much easier than solving for a whole entire function ok. 
So I plug this uh, expression for rho into the previous voltage equation and out comes this um, expression. So 4 pi epsilon I have taken up over there. The left hand side was originally 1 volt. So that 1 multiplied by 4 pi epsilon naught is what I got on the left hand side and uh, the rest of it is as before. Okay. Now we will go back to how we had decided we will solve this equation. So to solve this equation we had said that uh, if you look back uh, if you remember what we did previously we had said let us choose those points where I know the potential and I chose those points to be along the axis of the wire. Right? So uh, what we can do is um, there are n segments over here. So for example this is your y1, right? no, let us not call it y1. Okay. Um, what I, I have n capital N pulses. Right? That means there are capital N segments over here okay? and my number of unknowns are N. N okay. So what we will do is let us choose our uh, the observation points, let us choose them systematically. So let us choose the center of each of these N segments. So for example, this let us call this the mth segment and let us call this ym. Okay? This the, ch the choice of the uh, place where I evaluate the function, I also call it a, a matching point. Okay? Previously the y primes we called them as source points because that is where the source charges were and the corresponding place where I choose along the axis I call them matching points. Okay? So with this in place what will happen is 4 pi epsilon naught. Okay? So, the first, let us let's just open up this uh, integral over here. So the first will be A1. Okay. This integral will go from where to where? The first term, 0 to delta, right? because G1 will be the first term and G1 is non-zero only in the first pulse, first segment and 0 everywhere else. So in this limits of integration, it will become 0 to delta. right? Uh, what happens over here g n which is 1 for that part. So, I will have a d y prime okay. and here what will I have? What will be the two arguments? So, first one so y 1 I have right. Okay, so, we can make it say y m no problem. Okay. Correct. I chose some point over here y m. So, y m com, uh, comes over here and y prime is my limit a variable of integration that remains as is that was the first term second term will be now you can see the pattern <coughs> delta to 2 delta because that's where the second pulse is non zero dy prime r of ym y prime how many such terms will i have n terms right so this final term will have an this will be from um n minus 1 delta to the length, the total length and dy prime ok. So, we just expanded the summation that is all we did ok. This integral is of course going to be different right. This integral and this integral they are not going to be the same because even though the function sitting inside is the same, but the integral will be different because the limits of integration are different. Okay. So, starting off with uh, the idea of discretization, choosing the pulse basis functions, uh, opening up the expansion, what have we arrived at? We have one equation in how many variables? n variables and what are these variables? a1, a2 all the way up to a n. Okay. So, you can see where this process is going. Right. Here I have kept the, the matching point y m is kept general. Okay. So, but this keeping it general has given us a, a strategy that we can use to formulate, uh, I mean to get the solution to this. So, you, there are n unknowns, I need n equations. Right. So, what we will do is we will continue this process for all the matching points. So, what matching points will we choose? We will choose these y's to be the center of each of these n segments. Okay. Since there are n segments, each segment has one center y1, y2, all the way up to yn. 
right. So, the first equation uh, as before uh, what we will get is I will get a 1 integral from 0 to uh, uh, this thing and I have sorry there will not be this anymore because I replaced it by g ok and this will be y 1 y prime right. Uh, I have substituted the value of g to be 1 in that segment right. Finally, I will have a a n n minus 1 triangle all the way to l dy prime and I will repeat this for each of the uh, matching points. Final matching point will be at the very end right. So, at the very end what I will get so again first term will be a 1 0 to triangle or delta. first term and finally, the last term right. So, now what we have done is we have got n equations n variables seems like something we, we can solve right. So, uh, if we do it systematically all of these guys on the right hand side or uh, sorry on the left hand side can be made into a, a column vector right. So, I can take all of these guys and put them into a, a column vector b right and you can see that all of these equations have the variables a 1, a 2, a 3 all the way up to a n in one string right. So, that looks like what the product of the product of at least one vector, one row vector with a column vector. So, what should the column vector be? The column vector will be A's, A's will be the column vector. So, I can see so this uh, will be a column vector over here. So, that will be A 1, A 2 all the way up to A n ok. The first row of this will be what these terms right this integral this integral all of this and there is a pattern to this. So, similarly when I go to the next row this is yet another the mth row. So, all of that can be combined into one matrix and the size of this matrix is n cross n this is n cross 1 and this b over here is also n cross 1 right. So, I have uh, re rewritten this into we can say a x is equal to b where x is the unknown vector ok. So, this is going to be the objective of uh, I mean the approach that we will follow for all integral equations somehow get it into a x is equal to b where a and b are known solve for x ok. So, this is your thing x is unknown ok and you can see uh, there is a very nice general pattern that is um, emerging for what is the m n element of this matrix A. So, m is coming from what the m th matching point right. So, m th is the matching point which corresponds to the the row or the column I mean which does it correspond to a particular equation or a particular column the matching point equation right. So, that is the row number that is why it is a m n right. So, this is uh, that coming from the matching point and n over here talks about this n over here is going from here all the way to the right right. So, that is telling me the um, source point. right. So, your matching point is over here and your source point is over here right. I have kept it in general g over here in case we choose some other kind of function other than pulse ok. So, I have got a matrix element and I did not write it over here, but it is trivial to see what is b m in this case the mth element of the vector b what is it 4 pi epsilon naught right. So, this turned out to be really simple in other problems it will not be so simple 
Okay. So this sort of completes uh, the uh, description of how we arrived at a system of equations. So what did you do? You chose, you took your your problem, discretized it, chose a set of basis functions, then use those basis functions to simplify your, expand your integral equation, and convert it into a se discrete set of equations, which finally gave you a linear system of equations, and you solved it. Okay. So this. Uh, um, you can ask lots of questions. How do we know what n to choose? That would be the first question, right? Should I choose n equal to 2, 3, 4? What should we do? Hmm? As? See again? As large as possible. Okay. So, larger the n, the you can see intuitively, the better I will be able to approximate the actual function rho. The price that you will pay? Higher computational time. Okay. So that's one. That's one obvious trade-off for n. Uh, also, this uh, the expression over here for a m n that you uh, can see over here. This is where you can use your Gauss-Legendre quadrature rules or any other quadrature rules to evaluate this matrix element. Okay. So in this problem, it's a very small toy problem, so it will not matter very much even if you choose an inefficient um, quadrature rule. But you can imagine in real life systems, let's say you're calculating the radar cross section of an aircraft, you will have close to a lakh elements, right? And for a lakh elements, if you're trying to evaluate <coughs> this integral, um, the number of points you choose in your quadrature rule, the more the number of points, the more the number of function evaluations. And if I have to do this one lakh times, or a large number of times, or, you know, a million times or whatever, what will happen? Your cost of just evaluating the matrix elements itself, forming Ax is equal to b, is going to explode. So that's why you need as efficient a way as possible of giving you this Amn to desired accuracy. So that is the cost of making the matrix A. Then there is the second is the cost of solving Ax is equal to b. Okay, so that involves another course on numerical linear algebra. I'll just roughly tell you two things. There are two ways of solving Ax is equal to b. One is what is called a direct method, which you all have uh, studied in uh, high school. It's called Gaussian elimination. This works um, in uh, you know sort of reasonably small size problems. The MATLAB syntax is very simple: a slash b, right? That's what gets you your solution. The second is uh, what are called indirect methods. Right, so indirect methods are uh, iterative methods. So something called conjugate gradient method, um, if you've heard these words, uh, there are there's a whole family of iterative methods which will solve, which will not give you the answer in one shot. They will start with some guess and keep refining the guess. Okay, so if the problem size is very very large, you need to resort to iterative methods. And uh, as the course goes, I'll give you a little bit more information on these things. Okay, MATLAB also has these things inbuilt. All right, so that's about uh, the ways of solving Ax is equal to b. Uh, but let's get back to the simp the first question which I asked you: How do you choose n? Right. So you might start out conservatively, choose some small n, and then start making n larger and larger. Right. So I have uh, some graphs over here. So the first one is n is equal to five, and what is being plotted is your row as a function of this is my y-axis. Okay, so I just chose five segments. What's uh, system of what will be the size of my a? Five cross five, right? I solve it. I get the solution, and this is what the voltage. Uh, sorry, the so uh, uh, charge density. This is what it looks like. Intuitively, it makes sense. The charge is tending to bunch up towards the end. There's of course at the center, it's not zero. It's not gone to zero because the charge it will still be there. Right, as you said rightly in the start of the lecture, there will be some sort of an equilibrium that will be established where the forces are in balance. Okay, so this was for n is equal to five. As we went further to n equal to twenty, what happened? You see that the solution is beginning to look a little bit smoother now. Right here, there were big jumps over here. Now the jumps are there's still one big jump over here, but these jumps are now smaller. So I'm able to approximate the function better, and 
this was for n is equal to 20. Again, it will take hardly a fraction of a second on uh, to solve this. So now, this sort of brings the question, how do I actually choose n? So one popular way of doing it is that you take your, so let us say your solution that you got at resolution n. Okay. Now let us say I increase from n, I go to a larger number m, okay, where m is greater than n. What I can do is I can find out the relative change. So x, okay, this is the this, this is just the difference between the two. I can take the norm of this vector to find out how much energy is in the difference, and I can find out, for example, compared to the reference solution, what is the norm? So these when I say norm, I'm taking the the two norm of uh, the so x n is the solution obtained when n segments chosen okay and xm therefore is the solution with m larger number larger than n chosen okay now i can say that this relative change over here should be less than let's say some epsilon this epsilon can be something like you know you know 0 0.1 or 0 0.01 so you can say i want my solution to stabilize or converge within say 1 percent, 5 percent, whatever, depending on your requirement. Okay. What you will find is as you begin increasing n more and more and more, at some point your cost of computation becomes very large, but your improvement in solution becomes very less. So you are you have passed the point of, I mean you are getting diminishing returns. So at that point you should stop. So the systematic way is to implement inside your solver something like a, a check on the relative change in solution and stop when this threshold has been met. Then you can be sure that okay, the solution has converged. So the word for this process is called numerical convergence. Okay. Again, this is a key strategy we will use throughout this course in solving systems of equations. Right. Is it fine? Okay. So that is one way of uh, increasing the accuracy, increase n. Any other ways that you can think of of improving accuracy? Looking at the solution that I have obtained, can you think of some other cleverer way where I can keep n small yet get a more accurate solution? <coughs> Basis function should be, can be chosen a little bit more intelligently. Right? Here my basis functions were pulses. So I was forced to approximate my smooth function by a set of pulses. That is why I need large number of pulses. Right?